afternoon and, uh, and happy Monday. Uh, my name is Josiah Gilliam um, and this is the latest in an ongoing series related to equity, related to Mayor Bill Peduto's office, related to the Office of Equity uh, and just life in Pittsburgh. And I'm very excited to have this conversation uh, that we're about to have today, two of my favorite team members uh, and a real chance to explore some intersections of work um, the intersection, uh, like work in the mayor's office, but also the intersection of uh, private-public partnership, research, uh, community activism, organization, uh, and a whole, whole, uh, whole host of things. Um, the two main groups that we're going to discuss today are the Gender Equity Commission uh, and the LGBTQIA Advisory Council. Uh, and so to begin that discussion, we, we try to start with definitions and introduction, introductions, just so folks have a sense of what it is that we're going to talk about and what landscape we're going to cover. Uh, but because of these two groups, I think it makes sense, uh, and our, our team were talking about this before the call, uh, to start with an important acronym that will help uh, both define and frame the conversation that we are intending to have. And that acronym is SOGI. Uh, SOGI is spelled S-O-G-I-E, and it stands for Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, uh, and Expression. And so Anu and Tiffany, I wondered, before we jump into your introductions, uh, could we just speak about what the term SOGI means and how we can use it to understand uh, the buckets of mayor's office activity that we're going to talk about today? Sure thing. And maybe what, what might also be helpful is if we started off with our pronouns. So my name is Tiffany Semino, and I identify as she, her. And, um, you know, that may be helpful of getting the conversation started. Thank you, Tiffany. My name is Anu, and I use she, her, and uh, I appreciate the reminder, uh, a part of making sure that we recognize gender diversity um, and that people may not always be the gender that we assume to start with. So thank you for that. Great. Well, my name is Josiah, and I use uh, he, him. And now that we have that set, let's talk uh, about what you two both do at the mayor's office. And then we'll start with uh, the Gender Equity Commission and, and get the conversation rolling. So, uh, Tiffany, if you wouldn't mind, uh, your, you've shared your name and pronouns, what you do at the mayor's office and as it relates to the LGBTQIA Advisory Council. Sure thing. Um, my name is Tiffany again, and I am the Youth and Education Manager in our office. So I do a lot around children and youth, and I also serve as a liaison for our LGBTQIA Plus Advisory Council. Thank you so much, and Anu. Uh, my full name is Anupama Jan, which I mentioned just uh, because if people see it, uh, they don't get intimidated. And I'm the executive director for the Gender Equity Commission. We're the city's newest commission, uh, and I work with an amazing team of volunteers and city personnel um, to uh, erase um, gender-based inequities that local government has an opportunity to fix. Wonderful. Uh, Anu, I'd like to read uh, very quickly something that's on the Gender Equity Commission site for the city uh, as a way to begin the conversation. Uh, it says here that the Gender Equity Commission, or GEC, is tasked with eradicating gender-based barriers to equity by changing local policy and holding city government accountable. The GEC consists of 14 volunteers who live and work in the city of Pittsburgh, four of whom work in different capacities for local government and one staff member. Um, can you talk a little bit uh, about some of the definitions uh, at play um, when we're talking about gender and when we're talking about something like gender inequality or inequity, how would you help frame those ideas for us? Those are great questions. On the one hand, all of us experience gender from the moment of our birth, we are assigned a gender um, and it's, it's usually according to a binary male or female but we know from people's lived experiences and we know from research, um, historic and cross-cultural, that those two categories don't really uh, ex capture uh, gender diversity. We also have historical inequalities. Um, so, you know, simply put, women have not always been allowed to vote to own property, um, that they've experienced certain kinds of violence that have been not been recognized as gender-based uh, violence. So the Gender Equity Commission is partly um, trying to address those historical inequities, the legacies of which are very much um, present. We have a lot of statistical analysis that shows us uh, in our very city um, that uh, gender in combination with race uh, are, the, are the best predictors of outcomes. Um, and so there, there is still um, 
inequality based on gender that we need to address. We also are always thinking intersectionally and thinking about uh, being gender inclusive, recognizing that male and female binaries um, do not account and do not allow us to build fair and just systems for all people. Um, and so those are two very important things. And just to speak about intersectionality for a moment, uh, that there is no single issue that uh, is unaffected by intersections and overlaps of identities and our laws and our governments um, have also uh, created situations in which uh, the combination of certain kinds of identities has led to um, lowered opportunity and so we're really working on building equity um, and that includes removing historical barriers and also giving people what they need to succeed rather than equality which might say that we must give everyone the same thing and therefore the outcomes will be equivalent and that unfortunately is just not true so let's you mentioned um, that there is this assignment of gender at birth. Can we can we take a second to differentiate between what is meant by gender and physical sex in this case? Tiffany, would purpose. you like to would you like to speak to that? I can certainly <laughs> address it, but I'd love to hear. Yeah, I, if you could do it, Anu, I'd appreciate it. Sure. So, so this is, uh, and I, you know, I come to this work from years of um, being a scholar of gender and teaching. And so both gender and sex in our society are categories that we put on people that we know that there are many people who are born who actually don't fit. Um, they are sometimes called intersex, call themselves um, by various category names, but um, we know that people don't so easily fit into these very limited categories. And so assigned uh, people are assigned um, at what becomes both gender and sex at birth. So we say they're male or female and that's sex. And that's supposedly based on biology, uh, but because we know people uh, surpass these biological categories. And then the idea of gender is how people express their their sense of themselves in and once again we have male and female but there are also stereotypes implicit bias expectations um, so people often um, will define themselves as gender non-conforming or um, gender fluid to reflect that how they experience the world in terms of these categories of gender um, don't really conform to rigid binaries um, and so i think both gender and sex are things we want to uh, approach with a much more inclusive sense of the diversity of actual people <laughs> as compared to the categories we might believe apply to them. Sure. And so um, in, in this case, if we're saying gender equity, how do you explain what that what that idea is to, to folks? And I appreciate the background that you bring into this conversation, because for someone that doesn't have like myself, uh, that background, the, the explanations are very helpful. So what do we mean by, by gender equity here? So, uh, uh, so I think that, uh, and this is something I often speak about. So for example, I'll give you a question um, that I have been asked, which is, well, if you're working on gender equity, what about men? And on the one hand, we are absolutely concerned with the gender-based limitations on any human being. Um, we're really focused on the city, but of course uh, our work is, is global because these systems interact with each other. So absolutely, I care very much um, about uh, inequalities that men in our city are experiencing, people of all genders are experiencing. However, the category of female has been used to justify limitations to rights. There have been narratives about women should have certain kinds of jobs. And, you know, it's only about 50 years since the city of Pittsburgh stopped advertising jobs as male or female. There may be jobs where that is appropriate, but, but there are clearly many, many careers, many job opportunities that are not gender specific. And so when we talk about gender equity, we are really focusing on women because they have historically been barred from equal opportunity. Uh, and as I say, if anyone raises an issue and says, there is a systematic way in which being male um, is uh, preventing someone and preventing groups of people from equal opportunity and equity, we need to be working on that. Um, I unfortunately, not unfortunately, I cannot think of anything immediately, 
recently <laughs> where systematically our local government is creating barriers for people who are identified as male. The barriers exist for people who are identified as male and especially for people who are trans or otherwise don't match um, either category. Uh, and so we're, we're looking at those things that are very much uh, unfortunately built into our systems that really need intentional dismantling and unlearning our own implicit biases you know, do I think a woman is going to be a different kind of worker because of my own assumptions um, about gender, which are likely limited because we're all just people and um, have our own limitations. Yeah, so it's interesting because uh, here's an example of where from a systems and structures perspective, you're seeking to, um, to improve the behavior of those systems and structures relative to, to, to all people, but with a special emphasis on where there have been barriers in place, uh, put in place by design or lack thereof, um, that have negatively and outsized or that have impacted people based on their gender identity uh, and expression. Uh, but it's also a, 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 an, an example of where there's this chance to introduce the idea of internal um, individual bias. So you could say, well, the structure or system is set up this way, but this hiring manager, if there is, if there is unforeseen or unacknowledged uh, or unframed bias, it can affect the decision that is being made. Uh, and so it's a chance to, to talk, you know, both kind of at large and on the individual level. How do you all at, at the Gender Equity Commission walk that line? Because it seems like a pretty complicated, uh, a pretty complicated dance to do. I appreciate you saying that. Um, in some ways, taking an intersectional approach means that we care about everything. And so how do we identify how to take care of um, individuals while we're also trying to make systemic change? Um, and so some of the things I think that uh, are very important to do are to make sure that the people who are um, most negatively impacted by existing gender inequalities um, have a seat at the table, to use that phrase, um, that we make as many, um, we, I'm trying to think of the right metaphor, we uh, provide as many opportunities as we can think of to, to ask people for their input. Um, that we have an email account that's purposely very easy to remember, gender equity at pittsburghpa.gov. Um, and I routinely get emails from members of the public. Um, and I'll just mention to you, one of the issues on a lot of people's minds is gender inclusive bathrooms. Um, and I know that because people reach out to us, um, but we need to be hearing from the people. We can't be making decisions um, and trying to speak for other people so I think that's how we make sure the individual is accounted for that we're not only listening to the loudest voice or the majority voice but we're also really trying to, um, to hear and sit with sometimes uncomfortable um, critiques of the way we do things and as, as uh, all of us spoke about earlier we need to keep doing better to hold ourselves to um, a standard of, uh, of being informed by those voices that have been too often marginalized or dismissed. Uh, we don't have all the answers, um, but we try to make sure that we're asking really good questions and asking for lots of input um, from people. And, and people are just very varied. There is, you know, people of any gender identity um, or who are gender fluid, who are male or female, um, don't have the same views on things. So we can't let one, one person decide for, um, you know, tokenize one person to speak for an entire group. So that's how I think we try and balance the individual. And if we suggest policy changes that are meant to have effects on institutions and systems, um, that we don't want to look back and say, oh, we didn't think hard enough about those who might be left out in so the way like we're it, thinking. Can we just keep it with the example of the, um, of the gender-based or gender-free uh, bathrooms? Um, okay. Because this is, this is probably the example that has um, been spoken about the most just in like popular conversation. And there's a lot of uh, seeming controversy about it uh, and, different, and different stances people have taken. Uh, and yet to me, for the purpose of, the, of this conversation, this is a chance to talk about, like take, take, a, take a, a city municipal building. Is there a way from a design perspective to be as inclusive and accommodating and accessible to as many people as possible? And it's, it's, it's kind of related under subheading of, well, can you provide ramps and ways for folks uh, that have different exceptionalities to access 
the space and want then once they're in the space to have as welcomed uh, and as accommodated an experience as possible. Um, and so can you, can you speak about that issue? And you mentioned that folks have, uh, have reached out to you about that. And that for me, I think really explains what the Gender Equity Commission both has and can function as, which is an interface to city government for folks to, to, to give their input and to take part in process. Uh, but when it comes to the, to, the, uh, to the bathroom considerations, how do you, how do you explain um, the thinking there and, and what, would you, what would you tell us about it? Uh, and I think you, you really uh, made a great analogy that we're talking um, about uh, what might be called universal design. Um, how do we make especially things that are meant for all of us to actually not create new barriers and that um, we need to think about the diversity of human experience, different abilities, different access, um, and bathrooms become a material manifestation in some ways, and now I'm talking about bathrooms, and um, it might seem trivial, but it's a non-trivial expression of our values, especially right now, because we know that there are anxieties and the violence that has occurred in relation to bathrooms um, is not what some people might think. Uh, the violence is towards people who are um, gender non-conforming, not towards others. Um, and so what, what I feel very lucky to have been able to do, and this is the kind of work the Gender Equity Commission does that is not necessarily in the public site, is that the Department of Public Works um, is uh, charged with new bathrooms uh, for the city, um, and they are, are thinking and um, requesting input from every group to say, okay, this manifestation of a public space, what are all of the needs that people might have? And those include, well, first and foremost, it has to be a functioning bathroom. So we certainly need to think about that. Some of our buildings are very old. So in fact, uh, once you start to track the pipes, it turns out it takes two years to make a functioning bathroom in a hundred year old building. And so, um, Although the, the desire is certainly there to make it happen more quickly, we do have also those material limitations. But then um, what are the, the diversity of uh, needs that people have in relation to public facilities? Um, so we're talking about um, having changing tables, uh, making sure there are adult changing tables, and Tiffany has been part of these conversations and may have things to add, um, making sure that we have um, menstrual products, uh, that this is actually something that um, many people may not be aware of, uh, but that, uh, that menstrual equity is an important um, way in which, especially those who um, maybe have limited knee means um, or who live in places where they do not have access to um, safe um, and reliable menstrual products, um, that their daily lives are, are very negatively impacted. So uh, once you start to speak about providing products in a bathroom, you then have to think about fixtures. And I've been in conversations where we've talked about which fixtures are most accessible, what height would they be at? We want to make sure if someone's in a wheelchair in our bathrooms and needs a certain thing that they have access. Um, and then to go back to the gender inclusive part, um, our county code requires public facilities to be labeled male and female. And that's a stumbling block for us in the city of Pittsburgh because smaller establishments may not have the ability to create a male, female, and gender inclusive bathroom or what sometimes gets called a family restroom. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a movement and I know some people are interested in changing the county code because it may exist from a previous historical moment. Um, but if we have single stall gender inclusive bathrooms, we can create safe public spaces where people can can get on with the business of using a bathroom. Um, and so I, I, I think the Department of Public Works is being very, very intentional um, as they think about new building and ways of um, updating existing um, public facilities. And these things don't happen as quickly as we might like, but I'm, I'm proud of our city for doing the work of thinking about um, inclusion and access for all people. It's, a, it's, it's great to have this conversation with you because so much of that, of that even specific conversation seems to get drawn along cultural, political, or even religious lines in some cases. And yet here's an opportunity from a design perspective from a, uh, from a, a, a city considering what a building, how a building can function in relation to the, to the community uh, can look like. And it's, it's fascinating to, to figure out 
what might be possible there, even as you're discovering, well, it's actually going to take two years because it's a historic landmark that was built in 19, you know, it just takes, it starts to add uh, some complexity there. One last quick question, and then Tiffany, I'd like to talk with you um, about the advisory council or about advisory group. And then when we talk about the Gender Equity Commission, who are we, who are we like, what is the structure? Uh, how long have, have, they, have they been working? Um, and, and how do folks get in contact, you know, with them? Uh, thank you for asking that. Um, I work with an amazing group. Um, we have a commissioner who just came on board, which takes us to 14, um, and uh, 10 of those are volunteers that you have to live or work in the city of Pittsburgh in order to be considered, um, and anyone is welcome um, to self-nominate or nominate other people, and we, if you go to, to pittsburghpa.gov, you can find uh, the Gender Equity Commission and our email and how to contact us, sign up for a newsletter, are all available there. As I said, Gender Equity at pittsburghpa.gov is, is an email address that anyone is welcome to write to us. Um, we have people who are experts in a variety of sectors, nonprofit, education, higher education, um, researchers, um, activists, people who have a history of working on gender from a variety of perspectives. Um, they're also uh, diverse in terms of age um, and race. Uh, to a certain extent, and um, what they are working to do, um, so we're collecting data, and that's what led to the first report, Pittsburgh's Inequality Across Gender and Race, that was released uh, last September, um, but we're looking for reliable data that we can disaggregate, um, which means we want to look at multiple identity categories at the same time, because we know that, that these don't exist um, in isolation. And we're really interested right now in collecting qualitative data through community-based participatory research to then use that data to identify the patterns that are most relevant to our city. Um, Pittsburgh is not San Francisco, it's not New York, um, it's not Columbus. Um, we may have things in common because of shared national history, um, but we really need to understand the landscape here. And so the commissioners um, help to uh, collect that data um, through working with city processes, procurement processes, and then they try and help make recommendations for policy. So they do a lot of deep discussion, they bring their different points of view to bear, um, and we count on them to really uh, volunteer a great deal of time. Um, they're wonderful uh, in trying to do their best by um, the most uh, vulnerable populations according to gender-based barriers in our city. Thank you so much. Uh, Tiffany, I'd like to uh, start talking about uh, your work as well. Was there anything on what was just touched that you wanted to add in your remarks to before we do that? Oh, I don't know. Anu covered a lot. Um, no, I think Anu was very comprehensive and I think, you know, there may be some things that pop up along our conversation, but I'm good. Terrific. Well, I'd like to start in the same way, if that's all right with you, by reading um, the purpose of the LGBTQIA Advisory Council that's on the website, uh, and just to start there. So it says uh, here that the Mayor's LGBTQIA Advisory Council will be charged with taking a comprehensive approach to meet the, the needs of the entire LGBTQIA community. The Advisory Council will consist of a diverse makeup of members of the community. Advisory members will meet monthly, provide quarterly status updates to the Mayor, and will strive towards the goal of inclusivity and progress within the LGBTQIA community. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just, you know, how uh, you come to this work and, and what, how you explain what the council works on uh, to folks that you encounter in the community. Yeah, sure thing. Just to give you some um, kind of background on the council, um, the council came together in late 2016. It was, they were seated about December or so and um, has a wide variety of different folks that are on the council that are you know from nonprofits, higher education community organizations um, just community members and we really have um, have had a wide variety of folks that have served on the council and um, what they do is they make recommendations um, they meet monthly they um, make recommendations to the mayor around different things like public safety so one of the things that in our police academy our um, police officers are trained on soji and we've extended that to other departments as well. Um, we have, um, they hold different events. So just recently there was um, an unfortunate misgendering um, event of um, Dr. Levine and um, made by a member of the media. And in response, the, um, the council as well as Sisters PGH, um, the Transgender Coalition of Pennsylvania and the uh, Pittsburgh uh, 
um, Commission on Human Relations, put together a training around gender identity and awareness and the media. And that was so popular that they actually held a second one that was for the general public to talk about gender identity, the wide variety of gender identity um, that is out there and had some panelists that talked about their gender identities and how they would like to you know, make sure that they have dignity and respect in the community. So there's, those are just a kind of an example of some of the things that the council does. And um, one of the exciting things that's happening is the council is moving towards becoming a commission, which would mean, you know, similar to the Gender Equity Commission, um, you know, whoever is in office, there does have to be that council that is seated. It's then put into city code and has longevity. I see. So it, it, it could last beyond the, this is current administration and it's just something that the city of Pittsburgh does from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Um, and so you mentioned this idea, you know, this is a, a recent, um, recent news, recent event that happening with, with the misgendering. Um, in terms of communicating the value of what this, of what this training, of what this, this learning opportunity could be, like how, how was it framed? How, how, was it, how was it proposed? And like, what is, what is um, if someone wanted to, to kind of go through, uh, to learn themselves, you know, how would you describe what this, um, you know, training and experience looks like? Sure thing. And I actually believe that we do have a recorded version that we can share in the chat box. Um, and if we don't have it right now, we can share it a little bit later. But basically, it was a really great training. It was an hour and a half long. And um, the first half of that training was just kind of talking about gender identity, the variety of different gender identities that exist. And then there was a panel conversation with different folks who had different gender identities talking about their experience in Pittsburgh and in the larger community. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people are, you know, if you haven't ever met someone who is transgender or gender non-binary, it can be confusing. And, um, you know, people are kind of scared to ask questions. And it was a, a nice safe space for folks to kind of get that information so that they're able to refer to their friends, neighbors, coworkers, to be able to treat them that they, the way that they want to be treated. It makes a lot of sense because there's a certain amount of um, I remember when I first encountered the acronym SOGI, uh, I was at a training when I was working uh, at a workforce development organization, and there was like that level of learning that was very useful for me in terms of, you know, definitions, terms, and adding nuance to my understanding. Uh, but then there was a whole nother level of, un of, of through like interpersonal relationship, um, un having, having space in your mental model to allow for the lived experience of your friend, of your neighbor, whomever, um, to be to be shared to the extent that they feel feel comfortable, uh, and so it seems like this was a blend in that case too. Where yeah, you're dealing with terms, but then you also get to just hear from folks who can talk you know openly about their life. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say. Yeah, and I think you know, like um, Anu had mentioned, um, you know, gender is is really you know something that most children are assigned at birth. I mean, I think there is, are some changes now with some parents um, raising their children kind of gender neutral. But it's something that, you know, when someone is pregnant, um, you know, that's one of the first questions that someone asks. You say, oh, what are you having? And um, I think it's something that, you know, I even struggle with and as a member of the community, um, you know, but it's something that it's a change in our lexicon. And it's something that I think we're all learning together. And, um, you know, I just thought that was a valuable thing that Anu had mentioned that it's, it's you know, it's even prenatally, you are kind of given a set of expectations. Um, of what you'll do in your life, what kind of clothing you're going to wear, what your name is going to be, all of those things. And, um, you know, I think that it was a really valuable conversation that the group came together and had in that, in that training. Thank you very much. Um, also, I wanted to mention uh, some of the work as it relates to family-friendly uh, practices. Could you speak a little bit about what that means uh, in the advisory council's role in that? Yeah, sure. So this would be more of a city function, but um, the city overall has been looking at how to be um, more family friendly and um, knowing that, you know, in most cases, women are the caregivers in their um, household of children. Um, some of the things that we have done is that we, for our um, city employees, we have paid parental leave um, for men and for women um, or non-binary folks. Anyone that is a parent that either gives birth to a child, adopts or fosters is eligible for that. And they are able to take that, um, you know, up to six weeks. And it's a, you know, a valuable time to create that bond with your child, um, as well as to kind of ensure that, you know, uh, parents or parent figures in the home are able to kind of take that time. Um, we have uh, lactation rooms in our city county building, as well as our other building that's across the street at 200 Ross Street. 
um, and those are for any um, any person that may be you know breast or chest feeding that would like to you know um, it could be a member of the staff or it could be a member of the public. Um, we also do some child care, so we do child care um, for our staff on specific days during the year. Um, days that the Pittsburgh public schools are closed, but that we're open for normal kind of operating hours in our um, office buildings. And we also provide um, on site childcare for some of our larger community meetings. And that's been something that's been extremely popular. Um, we've been contacted by lots of other cities and counties who want to do something similar. Um, when I came into the office, I came from a family support and childcare background. And, you know, I would go to meetings and there would be lots of very young folks and then older, you know, retired folks, but there weren't a lot of, you know, younger people there weren't a lot of kids and you know that can be a huge barrier for um, families to be able to attend meetings and especially women who do tend to be the caregivers in the home you know if you can't hire a babysitter um, to watch your child or you don't have another family member you may miss out on those important community meetings which means that your voice isn't being heard mm -hmm. and this is something that the city has offered there's been a lot of conversation about uh child care being provided uh, in that in manner it, um, is this gaining a lot of momentum? Uh, anecdotally to me, it seems like more and more folks are considering this, Tiffany. Yeah, yeah. We, it's, we started um, about a year and a half ago, and we had just a couple families that used it. Um, and now, um, you know, when we're back in the office, we have a lot more families that are using that as well as out in those community meetings. So, um, you know, we have large scale public safety meetings or um, community development block grant meetings or budget meetings where, you know, your voice as a constituent is really important to have at the table. And if you're someone who has children in the home, you know, you have a different perspective than from someone who may have just graduated from college or maybe a senior citizen. So I think it's something that, um, you know, I think we're all working towards making more things more inclusive and childcare can be one of the things that, that allows folks to attend. Just like when we look at, you know, accommodations in terms of ADA or looking for a location that's on a bus line. Right. Another way, another way to handle uh, and to think about accommodations uh, and, and design as well. In this case, the design of the experience itself. Can you reduce barriers for folks that might not uh, participate otherwise? And should they decide to, can it be of a, of a quality and of a value uh, that, where it makes sense for folks? And it's cool to see that the, that the, uh, the city can move in that direction. Um, Anu, I'd like to talk about, you know, speaking of outputs for a lot of great city work, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, the gender equity report uh, that was released. You mentioned it um, briefly in your remarks last year um, because it's a really great, uh, there's a really great example of a lot of things uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, could you just uh, set the stage for us? Tell us a little bit about um, what went into the idea of, uh, of starting this process, how the partnerships came into play, um, and, then, and then into the, the releasing of the report itself. Absolutely. And um, there's a TEDx talk um, that describes some of this um, that is on, on our uh, on the city's web page. Um, so the, the Gender Equity Commission was created by an ordinance um, that a, a group of over 50 uh, local organizations came together in coalition um, and a local ordinance was passed and it's called a CEDAW ordinance and CEDAW stands for the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And it is a UN treaty, um, and it, you can find out more about its history on our website, uh, but it uh, really advocates for uh, creating equity by uh, doing local scans uh, to find out what the gender-based patterns are. Um, in our case, in a city, um, some places in the U.S. have done this on the level of a county, and then um, some small countries have done um, gender analyses. So that first report was an effort um, to do something that, that really hasn't been done. On the one hand, although there is a lot of data, we're in the era of big data, there's also a gender data gap that we've often not collected different kinds of data based on um, gendered patterns, gender-based uh, 
uh, barriers. Um, we're certainly very far from having reliable data about people who are gender non-binary or trans. Um, and so that's something we're also thinking very hard about how to responsibly and ethically gather data um, for groups who have been um, stigmatized and very vulnerable in our society. And so, um, so that uh, report, Pittsburgh's Inequality Across Gender and Race, we partnered um, with a team um, at the University of Pittsburgh School of Social Work um, who work on inequality. Um, but what we tasked them with was to say, when take all of the publicly available data about our city, and that's often from the census um, in American community surveys, and paint us a picture of how gender um, is manifesting in our, uh, in our local um, municipality. And um, because gender and race are the, um, you know, the best predictors of social outcomes in the United States, uh, we would like to do future reports where we look at gender and ability, where um, in conjunction with the LGBTQIA plus advisory council slash commission, um, that we look at, at those identities which are not reflected, um, that we look at races beyond black and white, which is certainly very important in the United States, especially in, in this historic moment. Um, but that there are many people uh, who are mixed race, who are Latinx, who are Asian American, who are Arab American, um, who are not always captured in the publicly available data. But so that first scan um, was to help us prioritize. And what we found, um, there are incredible disparities, especially for black women um, in our city. And that's not new information, but our report um, is current um, and it is um, taking an intersectional approach. Um, what we did as a result um, that we found there were barriers uh, very particularly that the city has control over because the city can't really um, legislate uh, about health, uh, public health in the same way, because much of that happens at the state and county level. Um, but we can work on poverty alleviation and we can work on access to, um, to job opportunities um, and income parity. And so uh, based on that first report, um, noticing that some of the biggest gaps between different groups um, comes in terms of workforce, um, we have embarked on a workforce equity initiative. COVID-19, uh, as with many other people, has put us um, our plans somewhat in the air because they involve gatherings of people, workforce training, um, but we're, we're using a proven model that really should help people have access to um, high paying quality jobs um, and housing is something that we also really want to work on because we know those are two of the most important things that people need. We, uh, we need to uh, uh, provide people um, abilities to empower themselves, which they've been historically, um, you know, obstructed from doing because of racism and sexism, these systematic institutionalized inequalities. So the report was uh, an environmental scan based on gender and race to fill the gender data gap. And then um, we will continue to do reports as we're able going forward. But we want to use reliable data, not anecdote. We want to hear about lived experiences. But then we also want to see the patterns laid out for us so that we can prioritize policy interventions. So it, the um, what I was advised on as it relates to the gender equity report was that you all were doing a local scan, but pulling from empirical data. Is that true? And yes. And for those of us that aren't uh, uh, academic, um, what, is, what, is that, what does that mean? So it means that it's, it's publicly available data. Um, so the databases that are used, uh, for example, the census is very, very important. And that's something that many people in our office are, are just doing heroic amounts of work. Um, because the census is used to give us a picture of who lives in the United States, um, different categories. But it's also used to, um, to decide where funding goes. So if we know that there are groups reflected in the census, so that's the kind of data data that the first report used. What is available to all of us? And it's the same data that's used to make very, very important funding decisions. So that's what was used. Um, and, and I think that I, I'm certainly not an expert on the census, but I know that many people in the mayor's office um, are, are, are much more qualified to talk about that and the very uh, you know, significant importance that all of us participate, especially those from underrepresented groups. Um, 
And so, and it's, it's very simple and short. <laughs> so I encourage people to do that. Um, so that was why the first report started with that data. And then we will be um, working with researchers, community-based researchers, ideally, this year or next year um, to then add to that empirical um, publicly available data with original research about our city um, so that we can get more nuance. So let's, um, so it, it pulling from empirical data, it's looking at these intersections and, uh, and the reality of folks lived experience uh, here in the city. And if you were to give us a, like a Reddit style too long didn't read, like what did like TLDR what did it find? Um, what, 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 like summarizing what the report has said, which, which, and we should, a good place to acknowledge uh, the latest in an ongoing exploration of these realities uh, from folks in different sectors, from different backgrounds. Um, but since we're talking about this one report, uh, what did it say? So, <laughs> What it said, and, and I have um, seen some of the methodological criticisms um, that it used data from a one year period rather than a three or five year period. And I wanna just acknowledge that up front. I am not um, a social scientist. Um, and so I, I don't wanna suggest the report is perfect. I have seen no one argue with what it, by using that publicly available data in the way that they did, um, what it shows is, racism overdetermines quality of life in Pittsburgh. That it is the explanation for, for instance, in this case, black men in Pittsburgh may be most actively seeking jobs and are the least likely to be offered jobs. And, and so there are a number of situations. There's another sort of striking piece of it, looking at um, education, where um, black girls in eighth are not often um, given opportunities and eighth grade algebra is apparently a, a strong measure of success at K through 12. Um, they are not, of, not often given the opportunity based on implicit bias, assumptions, girls in math, um, racial bias. Um, but when they are given that opportunity, they, they outperform every other group. So what the report shows, and I use those two specific examples, um, the report basically says we cannot dismiss racism. Anyone who tries to say in Pittsburgh, everyone has an equal shot, who believes in the myth of meritocracy, the American dream, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. By using the data that is publicly available, um, the report says, you are wrong. And our report came out in September, and I think the national conversation happening right now, um, the collective trauma of both COVID-19 um, and the aftermath of uh, the killing of George Floyd, that many, many people in the United States are absolutely on a national scale recognizing the same thing, that the narrative of a post-racial America where everyone has an equal shot is just, it, we haven't gotten there. It's aspirational, um, but if we act as if opportunity is equal, um, we're doing an incredible disservice to many, many people. And in Pittsburgh, that, uh, the people bearing the brunt of that particularly are black and particularly are female in terms of the extremely high rates of maternal and infant mortality, which is unacceptable. That we in, in the city, in the region, all of us need to say, I, I will not stand to live in a city where this is happening despite the resources we do have available and the wonderful expertise and amazing people. Um, that we can all collectively work to solve these problems, um, but we cannot say, oh no, it's only a matter of individual hard work um, to yeah. succeed. Um, so I just want to stay here for, for a quick second and then we can, we can, we can move on. Um, a lot of the conversation as it relates to COVID-19 and um, racial realities around um, this global pandemic and say access to healthcare or just general health outcomes um, have been pr pretty solidly um, held within the notion of race. So we say that African Americans or Black people um, uh, may be at a higher risk because of other social determinants or pre-existing conditions. Um, and the report that you're met, the, that we're talking about now uh, does speak to some of those realities in a, a hyper-local systemic sense. But then there's this all there's this additional lens this additional layer of gender um, that, that, that uh, makes the, the data yell out at you, so to speak. At the, I know that doesn't sound academic, 
but it, it, it further underscores some of, the, some, some of those re, some of those if you can tell why maybe I have chosen a more uh, apt path for me um, the gender realities are um, are present and persistent and observable um, as well can you just speak a little bit to that to, to that too because um, because it's, it's a great uh, example of that of that race and gender intersection in this case. I, I'm really glad you brought that up because the Gender Equity Commission released a statement and um, I, I want to uh, recommend that people who may not be aware of it um, check out the Say Her Name campaign and Kimberly Crenshaw who's you know really uh, helped to popularize the idea um, and the concept of intersectionality and who's the executive director for the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies. Um, the Say Her Name campaign uh, points out that sometimes when we talk about police violence and racism, we forget the many, many um, African-American women, um, including trans women, who've also experienced that violence. So for some people, um, it is black men who are absolutely in our society very very vulnerable um, to institutionalized um, police and other kinds of violence and terrorism but um, certainly our country was built on exploitation um, and erasure of black women um, and so i mentioned say her name because in every case what our report um, is trying to model for everyone is that when we start to look at situations we need to ask is there a gendered impact here because if we don't ask that question we miss patterns that are crucial now we certainly need to do that intersectionally and say what are the lgbtq plus implications here um, who's being left out because of different abilities so i think that um, that's partly what our report i think um, and i have gotten emails from people around the country who have thanked us because it actually shows a methodology for doing this because it can sometimes seem hard well how do i take that kind of intersectional approach um, and for me the way that we all internalize it and and put it into practice is simply by asking that question there may be cases when we say, hmm, I'm not seeing a gendered impact, or there isn't a group that's being systematically treated to um, inequality. But if we don't ask the question, we might think that and re erase black women who are also victims, um, for example, of police violence. Um, and so I encourage everyone to, um, to check out Say Her Name. They've said it much more eloquently than I have. Um, and, and so I think that our report um, is dovetailing with a lot of other public statements, um, a lot of sentiment saying, who have we left behind? Um, and how can we create a new equitable normal post these very disruptive times um, where we won't have to look back and say, we did not do right by everyone um, in our city, in our country. I appreciate that. Tiffany, I wonder because and this my, you know, in my head, it's just kind of like the visualization of the lenses that are being added. But we have this exploration of, of, of race and gender in the empirical sense, in um, uh, the academic sense, but then there could be additional lenses of identity that can impact people's lived experience and also impact apparently how systems treat people and how decisions that systems make treat people. What, where does your mind go when you hear this discussion? Yeah, sure thing. So I go to thinking about the census. So this is the first year that the census is going to be actually tracking same sex couples. Um, right? And also it is a, um, it is a binary choice in terms of when you choose your sex and gender. So you only can choose male or female. So there's not another option. So for those folks that are trans or gender non binary, you know, they are not able to be adequately counted on the census. So I think of that and I um, appreciate what Anu was saying around, you know, making sure that we're working together, um, you know, we're that, you know, as the Gender Equity Commission is going to be doing reports that they will be working with the LGBTQA plus Advisory Council um, Future Commission, because I think a lot of the information that's publicly available does not adequately reflect the realities of the community and, and doesn't take into account the complex lives that people lead. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the pathway forward. I, I think it's a, a good conversation for us all to have, um, and then we can bring this conversation to a close. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to, uh, it's just with the gender equity uh, report, a couple, a couple other points. Um, there's been some learnings anew that have taken place, you know, uh, throughout the process, 
you know, certainly the report itself is a, is a learning opportunity. Uh, but since the release of the report, there's been a chance to engage with the community uh, in both in a sense of acknowledgement, but also uh, in engagement uh, that's taken place. And it reminds me of some things we've seen here locally uh, in the COVID-19 era, uh, you know, as well. So can you talk about, and you mentioned this a little bit already, uh, the, the, some of the next steps as it relates to qualitative research and participatory um, research and stuff like that. Can you talk about what happened after the rollout and how you all have pivoted um, and, and added to the scope of, of how you're uh, approaching this? Uh, I can, and, and I appreciate the question. I think um, one thing uh, to say first and foremost is um, there is no blueprint we can apply to creating social equity in the U.S. That we've got a history of people working towards a fair and just society, um, but the the things that the Gender Equity Commission, the LGBTQ+, uh, advisory Council, QIA plus Advisory Council, Future Commission, um, we are trying to create something that doesn't exist. And so we are, uh, we are, per, you know, necessarily experimental. And so with the report, we wanted to do this environmental scan. Um, and immediately after the report was released, um, a group of incredibly um, just wonderful uh, local black women and femmes, um, and most of whom are public health researchers, um, criticized the release of the report and the lack of centering uh, of black women's voices. And uh, we pivoted, we stopped all of the work we were doing um, and reset our timelines um, and engaged in the fall of 2019 um, in a series of community meetings. Um, and every meeting um, was about the Gender Equity Commission listening um, promising to do better, um, and also explaining um, how we'd gotten where we'd gotten. And I think in my experience, um, and I've been in Pittsburgh 10 years and then been doing this kind of work elsewhere, I have never seen something that actually put into practice community leading priorities. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just you know, we're setting up a meeting, here's the agenda, it's 2.30 on a Wednesday downtown. It was where are we gonna meet that everyone can come? How are we gonna decide? Who is gonna set the agenda? And we didn't set the agenda. Um, and in fact, I think for some commissioners, it was probably an uncomfortable place to be because many of them are professionals and experts in their own area. Um, but I think that we were practicing um, what might be called cultural humility. We will always be learning. Um, there will be unintended consequences, even from the best of intentions. Um, and there may be some consequences that we should have been able to predict. Um, but so I think that on the one hand, we don't want to be paralyzed and not do any work, but we also need to be willing to say we could have done that better or now we have more information that we did not have access to. And the one really positive thing for me from the report, which is tragic, I mean, it is, I, just to be honest, I read that report again and again in draft stages and cried because I don't want that to be a reflection of the city I live in. Um, so just to acknowledge that it, it, is, it is a very, very painful um, depiction of inequalities. But the good thing is, I think very few people in the city of Pittsburgh, even prior to recent events, could maintain um, a sense of ignorance about these realities. Um, and so force, it's a very uncomfortable thing to talk about race, to talk about inequality for anyone, um, but we have to talk about it. We're never going to fix it by continuing to practice colorblindness or other failed ways of getting to equity. So, so I would say that the report, it was, it was a very uh, emotionally intense time, and yet I feel it was putting into practice genuine equity, which is hard. Mm. When you're doing it, it's not easy and it's not quick. That's probably the way that we know we're actually doing something right. <laughs> um, you have that very tense feeling in your stomach and you know it's you're in it for the long haul and you have to keep working together and build coalitions with other people. It sounds like an extraordinary opportunity because if you're looking, if you're doing a local scan of just Pittsburgh, there's extraordinary systemic and structural realities uh, that you will uncover and that you can uh, appreciate and in some ways try to figure out you know, how to uh, effect and influence and change and all of that stuff and and some of that takes a long time some of that 
um, is already in the work. Some of that hasn't even been, you know, been approached. Uh, but what, if you are keeping it to a local scan, uh, scan of, of Pittsburgh, um, it also is a chance uh, to engage with folks that have already been thinking about this, but then also to include the voices of the, just of the people themselves, because it's a relatively finite amount of people here at the end of the day. Uh, and when yeah. you start to and when you start to talk about where you know folks where these lenses are at play and that impact them, uh, the, that number becomes even smaller and smaller and smaller. And so it becomes very interesting to wonder uh, what fixing it actually looks like. Uh, and this is where I come to the, to the conversation from the MBK perspective. Uh, My Brother's Keeper uh, has an initial race and gender focus. Uh, there's an initial strong focus on black men and boys. That was uh, in the original framework that the Obama administration put together uh, and that the original MBK playbook for Pittsburgh and Allegheny County uh, uh, crafted. It said, okay, let's take a look uh, at black men and boys to begin with um, and see what we can find from a data perspective to articulate the opportunity and achievement gaps, the things like the digital divide uh, or involvement with the criminal justice, uh, justice system, what have you, um, as a place to start. And this, there's this idea of, well, we, we have a, a concept that there have been persistent gaps in achievement and opportunity. Um, and if, if you solve for where it's the most blatant, then you kind of solve for the rest by default. But at no point was it a rigorous uh, academic or empirical analysis of this. We pulled from uh, data that, that we could. Uh, and then we also acknowledge the reality of intersectionality. All the organizations that raise their hand and say, I'm going to objective lead when it comes to early childhood literacy uh, or to STEAM and STEM, um, in many cases work with uh, black women and girls, boys and girls, uh, just people of all gender identities and expressions as it was. So it's a chance to kind of broaden, you know, broaden the scope. Um, and, and yet for me, I look at the gender equity report and it in many ways builds on and deepens the understanding around these same very issues uh, because, you know, plot twist, it wasn't a great analysis when we did it about black men and boys for the MBK playbook, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't a surprise that there are these racial and indeed gender uh, realities that it makes sense for leaders and for the community to see if they can absolve and resolve, uh, resolve so that um, we can all move forward. But then uh, my mind gets consumed with this idea of like, well, what does it actually look like to, you know, to do? And when I look at the gender equity report, for me, it's not about running away from any of the reality that, that's there. And that points, you know, to me, to individuals that I know in community and the pain and the anguish uh, and, and, the, and the frustration of trying to advocate, in some cases, for your, literally your own health and feeling like you are not being taken seriously or you're being outright denied or you don't have access and all of these things where it stops being esoteric very quickly and is like, that's that one story that that person told me about their time going to the hospital or whatever the case may be, right? <laughs> And yet I, and, and so I'm fully like as a, you know, adult uh, living here in Pittsburgh can, can acknowledge those realities. And yet um, there's a very strong uh, sense that I feel when I, when I think about what that report means to my mentees or to the, to the children that I work with um, through community-based organizations around the city. And, and I want, um, for me, I want, it's like I, I, I picture myself talking with them about it. I have not done this because uh, for a lot of different reasons, but I imagine myself talking to them about the gender equity report and explaining what it, what it, what it attempts to do and, and what it says. And then for me, it's like this moment of saying, this is not prophecy over your life. And what I'm here to tell you is that folks like myself and other leaders in the city and in the county and in healthcare and in our business community and our nonprofit community and our foundation community are trying to figure out how this reality is not the same for you by the time that you become an adult and that over time these things are in, in absolutely eliminated to the extent that we have agency and the ability to design. So, so and this is the, to open up to, to both of you, given the group that you're, that, you're, that you're referring to and that you're working with, what does success look like? How, how can we go about fixing you know, these things uh, with an eye towards you know, the young women of color, young black women, the young black girls that are in our city right now, that in 20 years or in 10 years, that they have a different experience. And that, and that if we do the same analysis, we will not see these same numbers uh, about their experience and, and, and about their reality. I'm wondering if Tiffany wants to jump in first. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I guess when I think of success, I think, uh, um, you know, my mind goes to education because that is my background. But, you know, I think a lot of it is educating each other 
um, and it's educating the community, educating workplaces. Um, one of the things that we have in the city is we do have the Commission on Human Relations, which is our enforcement agency, um, where we do have, you know, the Commission on Human Relations, it does have protections for sex, gender identity, expression, sexual orientation, pregnancy. So those are things that if you have housing, um, public accommodations, employment concerns, someone fires you because of your gender identity or, um, you know, is denying you housing because they don't want, you know, they, they think, um, you know, they don't want you in their rental, you know, that is illegal. And, you know, it is something that, you know, not everyone in the LGBTQIA plus community knows that. Um, and not any, everybody in the general community knows that. So, you know, it is, it's part of it is looking at what are the protections we have now? How do we make sure people understand them? And how do we kind of increase those protections so that there is, you know, the, that we have community support, but they're also, if we do have bad actors that are out there, you know, they are being held accountable um, because we don't want this in our community. And so the Commission on Human Relations um, right now has virtual office hours, and then they also have an online um, component where you can reach out to them. So if you feel that, you know, you've applied to a job and as a trans woman, you didn't get that job because you felt like they, they were, they denied you because of your um, identity, you know, that's something that you could reach out to them and that, you know, there are repercussions for those um, employers or housing providers you know, where they, it could be financial, it could be they, they have to, you know, give you that apartment or that job. Um, it could be that their staff have to be trained. So I think, you know, that's a part of it is just letting folks know that there are things out there to protect them and that here are the ways that, you know, here is how you can, can contact the folks that are able to help you. Thank you. Uh, Anu, any additional thoughts there? I, I think um, Tiffany just mentioned so many important things. I think two words are coming to my mind, and one is this question of accountability. And I think this is a national conversation that's absolutely happening um, about um, people being held accountable for casual racism to um, to benign neglect, right? That that when we know people um, are not getting equal opportunities, and when we know people are um, actually dying, um, dying younger or dying um, because of police violence, um, that we all have to hold ourselves and each other accountable in a way that's sustainable and systemic. And I think part of that is actually, you asked about what does success look like? I think uh, my first thought was 10 years may be too soon because we're, we're dismantling hundreds of years of oppressive systems um, that unfortunately um, collusions between government and, and banks and corporations have, have left too many Americans, um, just to speak of the national stage, um, too many Americans suffering um, and not having basic needs met. And so I think we need to redefine success that if there is if there is inequality in my community, in, in my city, that is on me. Um, if I'm not doing something actively, both for myself, um, because I think you know we, we are driven by self-interest, but that I wanna be able to look around and say, I could be anyone in my society and that would be okay. Mm. Um, and so I think success can be redefined um, and, there are, there's, I'll just end with, it's, there's a moral imperative, absolutely, but there's a business case. There, everyone is pointing to how the more diversity and inclusion we have, the more that people are able to actually be um, a part of the fabric of our communities fully and not be marginalized, the better off all of us are, and you alluded to this. So I think that really redefining success as I can look around proudly and say, you know, this is not, this is a society where everyone um, is actually treated equally. Yeah, it's really wonderful. Thank you uh, so much, uh, both of you for, uh, you know, for those considerations. Let's bring the conversation to a close. Any final encouragements? Uh, Tiffany, we'll start with you and then, uh, and then Anu can bring us home on uh, just right. other places to get resources, things you might want folks to consider, uh, or just anything you're proud or excited about coming up uh, in the coming days and weeks. Yeah, so I, I would just say in terms of the LGBTQIA plus advisory council, just keep an eye out. Um, we will be having um, some communications around um, that moving towards a commission. Um, we will also be working with some local organizations around some events for pride. Um, you know, we know it's, it's a very different reality right now and that we're not able to gather in large groups and to be able to, to show 
um, who we are in the streets like we, we would like to. So I think we're looking at some virtual means and we'll be partnering with some organizations. So just keep your eyes open for that. Thank you. Anu? Um, I just want to say thank you to you both. I feel like it, you know, in days when it feels um, very difficult that um, this kind of conversation is really energizing. Um, and I think the kindness um, and the willingness to think critically, uh, you know, combined um, that the national dialogue could benefit from people um, sitting down and talking to each other in this manner. So thank you so much, uh, both of you, for all you teach me um, and f for modeling just a way, um, a way to be. Well, thank you. And uh, modeling is the is the right word uh, that comes to you know to my mind because you know these conversations are about in many ways how our specific community and the city of government, uh, city of Pittsburgh, you know, government and even the mayor's office can be a part of this. But we're not having these conversations in a silo. And I think uh, there's a real chance to do some some learning that can um, expand our consciousness around what other folks are going to or going through. Um, and also how we might be able to play a role because, you know, a small community-based organization may not have the bandwidth to put together a whole gender equity commission, but they can engage with the one that, that works with the city uh, and figure out what it might mean, you know, for them. Uh, and then to the point that Tiffany was making, I mean, what better uh, encouragement could there be for folks that were being, um, you know, impacted by these realities to find that there is recourse um, and resources and counsel uh, and love and understanding, you know, for them. Um, and uh, and so anyways, I want to thank you both because uh, I have learned a lot on this on this conversation. And I think in many ways that that's that's the point. Um, it's less about everyone understanding the same thing and reciting it in unison. It's about us all being on our learning journey and extending each other grace as we as we do it uh, all for the for the benefit of, of everybody living that's near us everywhere that's living in our society uh, and community. Uh, and while I'm thanking people, I'd like to thank our two ASL interpreters, uh, Megan and Iris, for their time and attention. We always appreciate uh, having you all along you know, for these conversations. Uh, we're going to continue with this equity series uh, and other uh, public-facing broadcasts along uh, these lines in the coming days and weeks, so please keep uh, an eye out for that. Uh, in the meantime, please check out the resources that have been posted in the chat. We'll post some more later so folks can do deeper dives. Uh, and you can see contact information there and get involved to the extent that makes sense for you. Uh, but in the meantime, please take the very best care of yourselves, and we'll see you next time.